Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday, God. Thank you for another opportunity to come and to worship you, God. Father, I pray that our service today would uh, come up to heaven as a fragrant offering, God. That you would hear our, our, our praise, you would hear our, our prayers, God. But, but most importantly, that you would look down, you would see our lives, God. That our lives would glorify you. That we could be your holy people. We could be set apart. We could be a city on a hill, God. We could be a bright light in the darkness. Father, I pray that you help all of us to shine bright. I pray that you help all of us to be filled with your spirit, God. Please be with me. Help me to be filled with your spirit. To be able to preach the word powerfully, God. Like never before. Father, please be with us in our service today. Be with us the rest of the week. And we pray this on your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see all of your beautiful, smiling faces this morning. <laughs> so, you know how sometimes God changes your plans? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, God sort of changed our plans about what I was going to be preaching about today, as of, as of yesterday. And I was like, okay, i got to... I gotta change because you gotta be walking in step with the spirits. And so today, what I wanted to speak to you about is something that a lot of people talk about, but they don't really know what it is. Particularly, a lot of other churches, they like to speak about this word. It's a buzzword, and that is the word grace. We like to talk about grace, 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 grace. It's a wonderful word, but. You ask someone what it actually means, and they don't know. So the title of my lesson today is, The Grace of God. Amen. Come on. Amen, bro. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Come on, Tony. Come on, Ephesians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And chapter 2, verse 8, is one of the most important but also misunderstood scriptures of the Bible. People, they turn to this and they use it to say things that the Bible isn't actually saying. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8, the Bible says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Mm. What people say is they read the scripture and they say, oh, grace is a gift. It's all about God. Nothing to do with you. Mm. So we're saved. We're saved by grace. It's a gift. Hey, God gives you this free gift of salvation, has everything to do with God, has nothing to do with you. Mm. Right? Wrong. Wrong. Mm. So are you with me? Yeah. Right? You're coming to bro. Yeah. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that it is by grace that we are saved mm. through faith. Mm. Amen. That's important there. Yeah. That the grace comes through faith mm. is another great buzzword that people like to say, they like to talk about. And so we got to say, okay, what is faith according to the Bible? Well, if you go with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 11. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Preach that. Preach that. Hebrews chapter 11. Biblical definition of faith. Mm -hmm. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Mm -hmm. The Greek word here for confidence is the word hypotasis. And what this word translates to, it means to place under. Mm -hmm. Or it means a firm foundation. Mm. So what does the Bible say faith is here? The Bible says that faith is our firm foundation. Yes. Amen. And it says that it is, it is an assurance of what we hope for. The Greek word for this is ilogokis. It is a proof. That by which something is proved or tested. A conviction. Mm -hmm. So what the Bible says here is that this faith, this is 
what is placed underneath us. This is our firm foundation. It's something that is proven. People want to know this. It's like, okay, can you prove God to me scientifically? No, you can't prove God scientifically. God is outside. He's beyond science. Mm. But what can you do? You can have faith. Mm. Yeah. You can have that assurance. You can have that proof mm. yes. where you have a certainty, where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt Amen. that God is true. Mm. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the way. Amen. And this faith is a requirement for grace. Mm -hmm. People, they, what they reduce grace to is an intellectual concept. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that people, they agree with this concept of grace. They're like, wow, this is a nice concept. I agree with it. I believe in that concept. Right. But that's not what the Bible is talking about, is that we got to have faith, not in the concept of grace. Mm -hmm. we got to have faith in the person who gives us that grace, which is Jesus. Amen. Right? There's a difference between having faith in the concept, theoretically, of grace, mm -hmm. and having faith in the one who gives us the grace, which is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Amen. Come on. Come on, Dave. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Mm -hmm. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace. What is this word grace? Well, the, key, the Greek word for this is the word charis. This is where we get our word or charis. It's where we get our word for charity from. Right. It says, that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, or loveliness. Ooh. Right? So that's what grace is. Grace is lovely. Amen. It's sweet. Mm -hmm. It's enjoyable. It's pleasant. Mm -hmm. the, the root word for this word, uh, charis, is the word chairo, which means to rejoice or to be glad. So this is what grace is. It should be a rejoicing. It should be a gladness. And this grace is a gift from God mm -hmm. that we receive by faith. Now, a lot of people, they, they mix up grace and mercy. And they kind of, they, they fuse these things together. Right. And they, they think that, that grace is kind of the, the same as mercy. They're not really the same. Mm. I like a, one way that I like to explain this to people is in the story of Les Mis. Right. So in Les Mis, you have a, the main character, the protagonist, his name is Jean Valjean. And Jean Valjean is a, a convicted criminal. He was a thief and he went to prison for 19 years. So after he escaped from, or after he was released from prison, he then went and uh, was completely rejected by the world. Nobody wanted to take him in or hire him. So he was basically a vagabond wandering around. And he's taken in by a, a local bishop, Bishop Miro. And the bishop takes him into the, uh, the church gives him food, offers him shelter, loves him, takes care of him. And he says, okay, you can rest here for the night. And what does he do? He gets up in the middle of the night and he steals all the silver from the, from the bishop mm. and leaves. And of course he's caught. And the police catch him and they bring him back to the bishop. And they say, hey, this guy stole your silver. He is a thief. He's been to prison. He stole again. No repentance, no change. This is the situation. Mm. Now, there were three options that the bishop could have done in this situation. The first option is justice. Mm. Justice is that this guy, who completely rejected the love, kindness, uh, everything that was given to him by the bishop, mm. completely no repentance, no remorse, just went back to his sin again, stole the silver. So it could have been justice. Okay, great. You're going back to prison. Mm. That was the first option. And that would have been right. Mm. It would have been right for him to go back to prison. Because you see that he just, he didn't change. But he didn't get justice. The next option is mercy. So he could have been given mercy to say, okay, you are a thief and you stole my silver, but I'm going to forgive you. And I'm not going to charge you. I'm not going to send you back to prison. 
Mm. That'd be pretty good, right? Yeah. And that'd be more than most people would expect or most people would, would be entitled to. But then there's a third option of grace. And what the bishop does in this story is extraordinary because he says, oh no, he didn't steal that silver. I gave it to him. And actually, you left so quickly, you didn't take the best silver. And so I'm going to give you this silver as well. Wow. 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 That is grace. Mm. It's not justice. <laughs> it's not mercy. It's actually beyond mercy. Mm. It's getting a gift that you don't deserve. Yeah. Grace is the most inspirational concept in Christianity. Mm -hmm. There's lots of really cool things in Christianity. There's lots of, of exciting concepts and ideas and principles that we find in the Bible that are really cool, mm -hmm. that are really inspiring, that are really strengthening and encouraging. Yeah. But by far, the greatest one is grace. Mm -hmm. And it's a real tragedy that we don't spend more time talking about it. Yeah. And this is why God, I think, put this on my heart. Is like, okay, we got to get back to talking about grace. Yeah. Really talking about it. Talking about it from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk to us about three things today about grace. Come on, Point number one. There, these are three things that grace does for us mm -hmm. yeah. that we need to remember. We need to hold on to. Amen. The first point is this. Grace saves. Amen. A lot of people, they just jump into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and they just read verse 8 in isolation. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. Come on, bro. Come on. Verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Mm. What is wrath? Wrath is God's judgment. Mm. Righteous judgment. As we said before, this is justice. When someone breaks the law, there needs to be just punishment for them. And God is a just God. So when we turn away from God and when we sin, there has to be justice. Mm -hmm. And what it says here is that we all were deserving of wrath. Mm -hmm. right. One of the things that really takes away from the power of God's grace is taking away from the understanding of God's wrath and God's judgment. Mm -hmm. Because without a proper understanding of God's judgment, you can't appreciate God's grace. Mm -hmm. We just, we just go straight to grace. Hey, Jesus died on the cross so for our forgiveness, so that's awesome. The end. Mm -hmm. But we got to say, what do we need to be forgiven of? Mm -hmm. That's what we got to remember. And that's what Paul is reminding the people before he talks about the grace, he talks about the sin. Mm -hmm. He talks about the wrath. And I think that this is something for us to really understand is that grace saves, but we got to understand what grace is saving us from. Mm -hmm. Amen. Bro. If you go to Romans chapter 6. Come on, let's go. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. See, a lot of people, they talk about Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And we like to talk about how it's like this collective sin, the world has fallen, there's lots of bad people that are out there, and everyone needs grace, right? Mm -hmm. But in Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, mm -hmm. but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. It describes sin as wages. Mm -hmm. The Greek word here is what it's referring to is talking about a soldier's wages. So when a soldier goes off to campaign, he's then entitled to payment. Mm -hmm. So that's a very vivid picture. Mm -hmm. We are campaigning for Satan wow. on a campaign of sin. Wow. And we're entitled to payment for that campaign that we've been raging. Yeah. That's a different picture here. This idea of a soldier, not for God, but for Satan. And we 
wreak havoc in this fallen world. And the payment for that is death. A lot of people, they struggle with this idea of how could a loving God send good people to hell? Right. Well, it's a very simple answer, is that God doesn't send good people to hell. Mm -hmm. God only sends bad people to hell. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very bad person. Mm -hmm. And so are you. <laughs> and what happens is that we don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about our sin. Mm -hmm. We don't want to think about our sin. Paul, when he goes and he speaks to the Ephesians, he reminds them of who they were. He's like, hey, this is who you used to be. You used to be deserving of wrath. When we become disciples, we very quickly want to forget about that. We very quickly want to get away from the wrath. We're like, okay, we're saved, we're covered in the blood of Jesus, everything is awesome. But what about when it wasn't awesome? What about when we were still in darkness? What about the sin that separated us from God. We want to distance ourselves from that. We don't want to think about it. We want to forget about it. And what does that mean? It means that the, the, the power of grace then gets diluted. Because when you dilute your sin, you dilute the grace that is applied to your sin. You see the two are, because if, no, if there's no sin, there's no need for grace. And so the more sin, the more need for grace. Now, this doesn't mean that you go off and you start sinning more and more and more as a license to get more grace. All of us have sinned plenty. <laughs> We've got plenty of sin. We don't need any more of it. But the more we understand our sin, the more we understand our need for grace. <laughs> what stops us from understanding our sin? Well, if you go to Psalm chapter 36. Go, mm. cool, bro. Please stop. Psalm 36 in verse 1. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. It says in verse 36, verse 1, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or to hate their sin. Oh, wow. What can happen to all of us is that we flatter ourselves and cover up our sin. This comes from a lack of fear in God. And it's very easy. It's very easy to cover up our sin because sin is ugly. We don't want to talk about sin. Yeah. But in order to understand grace, you have to talk about sin. Yeah. We can't cover up our sin. We can't pretend, hey, that's old news. Because, first of all, it's not old news because uh, we sin every day. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you should have enough understanding, you should have enough sin on a daily basis to be like, man, I need God. <laughs> but, that, but that isn't what happens, mm -hmm. largely. Mm -hmm. What happens is, is that we flatter ourselves. Mm -hmm. We convince ourselves that we're not really that bad of people wow. because we look at other people. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, I'm not doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing what she's doing. So I'm not that bad of a person. But when we look at God, and we look at the standard of perfection, we see that we have a lot more sin than we want to admit. Preach, bro. Jeremiah 17. Come on, Dave. Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in a parched place of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. When we flatter ourselves, when we want to pretend like we don't really sin, what does it do? It blinds us. Wow. It blinds us to the reality. It blinds us to the barren wasteland of our life. Because we don't want to be honest about our sin. We want to rely on ourselves. We want to trust in our own feelings. Yeah. Verse 7. 
But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They'll be like a tree planted by the water, it sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruits. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts hide our sin from us. It's a, it's a defense mechanism. We want, to, we want to avoid the pain. We want to avoid the ugly truth. So what do we do? We lie about it. And all of us do it. I do it. You do it. Everybody does it. Doesn't matter if you come to church on Sunday. Doesn't matter if you're hungover on Sunday because if you're going to church on Saturday. <laughs> we all do it. Yeah. And what we got to do is we got to recognize it. We're like, wow, okay. I can struggle with self-deceit. Be honest about it. Mm -hmm. My heart is deceitful because I believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what does the Bible say to do? It says that God searches our heart, examines our mind, and rewards a person according to their conduct. So it isn't about what you feel. It isn't even about what you think. It's about what you do. Mm. And that's the good news. Yeah. Is that when it comes to really having a, a, a sober estimate, a sober analysis of our sin, it's not so much how we feel, it's what we do. So there's a few simple things that we can do to really get a sober estimate of our sin. You guys want to hear what they are? Yeah. First John chapter one. Yes. Go there. Come on, babe. Go on, Kobe. First John chapter one, verse five. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you can do to have a more sober estimate of yourself? Confess your sins. Mm -hmm. Confess your sins regularly. Mm -hmm. What, I, what I've really seen recently is that I've not done a good enough job confessing my sins. And as I was out last night, I went out and I was praying about what I should be preaching about today. I was like, man, i got to confess my sins. And I was up late last night, sent a message to my disciple, uh, long list of everything I could think of. Wow. Like, not all of my sin, just all of the sin I could think of in that moment. Wow. And I'm sure there'll be more sins that comes up that I'll be able to... Whenever he gets back from his trip to Poland, I'll be able to, uh, to give him a call and be able to say, there's actually more sin. But we got to confess our sins. Mm -hmm. And we confess our sins to one another, not to God. This idea of like, hey, I'm just going to go out, I'm going to pray, I'm going to tell God all the bad things that I've done. God already knows the bad things that you've done. Right. You don't need to tell him. And this is the thing is that it's, it's one thing where you're, you're alone. And it's just me and God. But it's actually not you and God. Because you're separated from God. Because you're in darkness. It's just you. So you're actually just confessing your sins to yourself. But when we're together, we bring everything into the light. Now here's the thing. Sin looks very different in the light. Yeah. Sometimes, things look much worse in the darkness. And then you put on the light, you're like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Sometimes, things look not that bad in the dark. And then you switch on the light, you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what is this sin? And I, I've had both experiences. I'm like, oh, I'm such a wicked sinner, this is so terrible. And I confess, I'm like, hey man, bro, it's, it's, you're, you're overreacting here. <laughs> but more often than the case, I minimize my sin. Mm. This is many people. Many people, they minimize their sin. Like, it's not that big of a deal until we confess it. And then we see, actually, it's much more serious. <laughs> than we previously wanted to admit. So, 
this is why we're going to be having a night of atonement. Is that uh, the, God put this on my heart last night? It's like, okay, I need to confess all of my sins right away before I get up and I preach this. But I, we got to get the whole church together. We got to come to confess our sins yeah. to one another, to really to help us to have a sober estimate of who we are, so that way we can appreciate God's grace yeah. and understand the grace that we've been saved from, yeah. or so the sin that we've been saved from, the grace that saves us from the sin. So, confess your sins. What's the next thing you can do in Matthew chapter 7? Cool. Matthew chapter 7, in verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Mm -hmm. What's the next thing you can do? You can ask God. Mm -hmm. You can ask God for help. Yeah. God, the Bible says that my heart is deceitful. Mm -hmm. God, I feel like I don't have an estimate, a sober estimate of my sin. Mm -hmm. God, please help me to more clearly see my sin. Help me not to be deceived. Mm -hmm. If you ask, God will answer. Yeah. And especially if you pray and fast. Mm -hmm. Fasting in the Bible was done for one of two reasons. Guidance and repentance. Mm -hmm. Situations like this is both. You're like, God, please give me more guidance to see the areas of my life that are in darkness. And I want to show this as an act of repentance that I don't want to live in sin anymore. Mm -hmm. So, what, do you, what can you do? Pray and fast. It's very simple. This number one, confess your sins. Number two, pray and fast. So this is my challenge for everyone in the church. Is that uh, I want to challenge you to write down what's called a sin list. So write down your sins, and then pray and fast about these. And then we're going to get together. We're going to be able to confess our sins to one another, so that we all can get God's grace. We can be unified with one another and unified with God. Amen. And this is awesome, yeah. because Christianity is the only religion that you can do this. Yeah. You cannot confess your sins in Islam. You cannot confess your sins in uh, Buddhism or Hinduism. Definitely not atheism. You have to stay in darkness. But what's inspiring about Christianity is you can come into the light. Yeah. Amen. And so, we're going to do that. Amen, Amen church? Amen. Amen. Point number two, grace teaches. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Come on, Kobe. Come on, Dave. Preach that. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So this is another thing that many people get wrong about grace. They think it's a one-and-done type thing. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you get grace, you get the forgiveness of your sins, you get that salvation, and you're good. Mm -hmm. You got grace. It was a gift. It's like it's a, like a lifetime membership to something. <laughs> We're going to give you a lifetime membership to Disneyland. Wow. And that's it. Just come to Disneyland whenever you want. Because it's a gift. But the Bible says that grace teaches us. Mm -hmm. It teaches us two things. It teaches us no to ungodliness. Mm -hmm. The Greek word for this is asebia. It's a lack of reverence toward God. Wow. What is reverence? Proper respect. Mm -hmm. See, what happens is that when we're in darkness, when we're in sin, we don't respect God. Mm -hmm. We don't value God. Because mm -hmm. we don't understand God. And this, again, we, we shouldn't get surprised by this. We shouldn't get discouraged in a city that doesn't revere God. Yeah. When people don't respect God, when people don't respect God's word, we shouldn't be shocked. Mm -hmm. We should understand that these people haven't experienced grace. Mm -hmm. They're like, why should I respect God? Why should I care about Jesus? Why does this matter to me? Mm -hmm. They don't know grace. Grace hasn't taught them about why they should revere God. The next one, as it says, 
It says no to worldly passions. The Greek word for this is kosmikos, where we get the word cosmos from. And it speaks about the, the universe, the world. But for this context, what it's speaking about is talking about belonging to the world, the physical world, not the spiritual world, specifically having the character of this present corrupt age. Wow. So when it's talking about this worldly passions, it's talking about these fallen passions. Mm -hmm. Things that have to do with sin. Mm -hmm. Grace teaches us to say no to these things. Mm -hmm. Now, many of us were raised with this kind of sense of morality, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe this came from our parents, maybe it came from greater society, maybe it came from the church, and lots of different things. But what happens is when you experience grace, you start learning new things that maybe you weren't previously raised with. Yeah. You start learning that actually, oh, that's not acceptable, that's not right. Mm. And that isn't from any lecture or seminar or whatever, it's the grace of God mm. that teaches you these things aren't right anymore. Yeah, and when people aren't learning to say no to these worldly passions, it's because they're not experiencing grace. Mm -hmm. Think about myself. Um, I grew up in the church. I grew up uh, going to Bible studies and classes and everything and studying about grace. Mm -hmm. But I didn't experience it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a missionary for two years in Indonesia. I grew up as a missionary kid. And uh, one of my favorite things to do as a missionary would be to get together with one of the other missionaries and to go uh, drink and smoke and talk about theology. <laughs> and I, I smoked. I smoked a lot. I smoked cigarettes. I had a big collection of different types of cigarettes and clothes and menthol and big and shorts. And I, I smoked a lot. And I like pipes and pipe tobacco. I like to roll my own cigarettes. I like to, um, I like cigars. I really like cigars. I, have a, I, I had a humidor full of Cuban cigars. And I got really big into it. I was like measuring the moisture and everything. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, you gotta get it to the right, the right humidity. Yeah. <laughs> and I was really big into smoking. And we would talk about God while we smoked. And uh, we, talked, we talked about smoking tobacco and like various different types of tobacco. We also talked about smoking um, cannabis. And the only reason we didn't smoke cannabis is because we were in Indonesia at the time and it was almost impossible to get a hold of cannabis because it was very, very difficult to get drugs in the place where we were. But that was the only reason why I did it. Because if cannabis would have been available, we definitely would have smoked cannabis together and talked about God. And I remember studying the Bible, and I remember getting baptized, and about the week after I get baptized, I, I mentioned smoking. And they're like, oh, you smoke? You can't smoke. And I'm like, what? <laughs> they didn't mention that in the Bible studies. <laughs> and I, this was a revelation for me. I was like, so I can't smoke cigarettes? Because I, I hadn't been smoking while I was studying the Bible. <laughs> and so, because I just just wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> and then after, I wanted to smoke, and it's like, you can't do that. And this was a real, like, okay, so, maybe not like cigarettes, but what about cigars? Like, I've got my humidor, I've got my box of cigars. What about my pipe? C.S. Lewis, he smokes. Oh my gosh. And what it was is, it was a lack of understanding of God's grace. And I wrestled with it for a little while, but then as I thought about God's grace, I thought about my sins that I had just been forgiven of. thought about all of, because I, I, I wrote a sin list down, I confessed all of the sins that I did, and then I got forgiven of that. And then I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to smoke anymore. Because of God's grace. God's grace has taught me that this is not acceptable. And even though in growing up and in the church that I used to go to, this was acceptable. And my friends that I used to go, and we used to talk about theology and revelation and all these different things and just talk about concepts. But we didn't talk about grace. 
Because if we would have talked about God's grace, it's very clear we wouldn't have been smoking. And so this was something that it, it taught me, like, okay, I can't do this anymore. This is no longer acceptable because of God's grace. So that was something when I first became a Christian, and I, I had to give up all of my cigarettes, I had to give up all of my lighters, because I had a nice lighter collection. Oh, of, well, wow. I, was, I was very big into smoking. Um, <laughs> what's a, a more recent example of this? Netflix. <laughs> so, as, uh, as the world is becoming more and more wicked, mm. it's becoming more and more obvious. Mm, yeah. And one of the things that I, I've struggled with over the years is uh, online streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. And seeing that uh, movies are okay. You got bad movies, you got good movies. But all of these platforms, what they do is they make their original content. Mm. And it was a couple of years ago that my, my friend, I was having a conversation with him. This is another guy in the church. He's like, man, like, I just feel like I can't watch anything on Netflix. Mm. It's, it's all bad. Mm. And I was like, yeah, it's, just, it's pretty much all bad. There's not very much you can watch on Netflix. Mm. And the reason for it is, is that movies, they're rated. They have a certain criteria of what they're allowed to post and what, the, what they're allowed to, to include and what they can include. Mm. But these online streaming platforms are online. So they can post whatever they want. Wow. And what's happened over the years is that these shows on Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, all these, these different online platforms are becoming more and more wicked, yeah. more and more worldly, increasingly violent, increasingly sexual, increasingly disturbing. Yeah. And so at the beginning of this year, that uh, I just really came to the conclusion, like, okay, there's basically, like, nothing I can watch on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I, there's just, there, there isn't anything there. And, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stick to, to Disney+. Plus. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much all I can watch. <laughs> but you want to know, even with Disney+, Plus, Still, yeah. Yeah. is that some of the messages that they're putting in these, these programs to children is, is worldly. And it's like, man, I, I don't want to be associated with that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a part of this, this worldliness. It's part, it's character of this present corrupt age. Yeah. And I was like, okay, maybe God is telling me that I should be spending my time doing other things rather than watching TV programs and series. Mm -hmm. And so I mean, this is just one example I think this is just one example. This is an example when I first became a Christian, something that, again, this is in the last few weeks, where I'm just seeing is that there's just, just the, the content of these streaming platforms is just worldly. Yeah. And God's grace, again, this, nobody did a Bible study with me on this. Right. It's not like I, like I came across a scripture that's like, Netflix is bad. <laughs> no, it was just God's grace where I was just like, I just, I can't do this. I can't watch this. I can't participate in this anymore. So I want to ask you, what are the areas in your life that are worldly? Mm. What are the areas of your life that are irreverent? Mm. Are you waiting for me to preach about it from the pulpits? Mm. Are you waiting for somebody else to call it in your life? Or are you looking to God's grace to teach you that this way of acting, this way of living, this way of thinking is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. This is a great thing about God's grace, is that God's grace, not only does it save us, but it also teaches us how we should live our lives. Mm -hmm. Because we're not in heaven yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're still a part of this fallen world. Right. We are in the world, but not of the world. Right. Mm. So how do, we, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Okay, what does the Bible say about Netflix? Mm -hmm. Well, we have God's grace. Mm. God's grace is able to teach us and guide us and to, to allow us to know, to teach us how to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Mm. Mm. Come on, Kobe. Cool. Point number three. Grace changes. Yes. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he says this. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, and do not deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul really believed this. He really believed, like, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle. This is, has not been my heart. Is that by God's grace, I was appointed an evangelist in 20, uh, 2017 in Manila, Philippines. And I many times have thought I'm a great evangelist. I've even in my arrogance gone so far as to say I'm the best evangelist. Definitely not called myself mm -hmm. the least evangelist. Mm -hmm. And I've not seen myself as someone who doesn't deserve to be an evangelist. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Paul did this is because he says, hey, I persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. He understood his sin. Mm -hmm. And just being honest with you guys is that this is something that I've really wrestled with. Mm -hmm. Is that God put this on my heart? I was like, man, I'm going back to this basics of grace. Is that okay? God has really shown me that I've been very out of touch with my sin. Mm -hmm. Because it's impossible for you to think that you're great. It's impossible for you to think that you're the best if you know your sin. Mm -hmm. And what he says, he says, I am the least of the apostles. And this wasn't. This wasn't hyperbole. This wasn't rhetoric. This was a conviction that he had. He really believed this. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could stand up here and say, this is my conviction. I'm just like Paul. I really believe that I don't deserve to be here. But there are moments when that's not true. Mm -hmm. There are moments when my heart deceives me. Mm -hmm. When I'm not in touch with reality. Mm -hmm. There are moments when I don't really see myself the way that I should see myself. Mm -hmm. But I stand before you here saying that I'm working on it. I want to be able to get to a part, or to a place where I'm really able to say, like, I'm the, I'm the least of the evangelists. Mm -hmm. like, this year has been challenging for me. I've been learning a lot. <laughs> and God has been giving me plenty of examples to see where I'm the least. <laughs> and it's good. I need it. And that's how much God loves me. God loves me enough to not let me believe the lie that I'm the best. God loves me enough to help me to see how much I need Him. God doesn't let me continue on in delusion. Mm. Wow. God comes in, he brings the reality in mm. to shatter the, the fantasy, to help me to see where I'm really at. Mm. And that's where God has been. And that's why I'm really grateful for God's love. See, Paul, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. As I went out last night, I was praying, I was like, man, like, God has shown me so much grace. Mm. And Paul says, the grace was not without effect. Mm. No, I worked harder than all, the, all of them. Who's that? All the other apostles. Mm. Again, this wasn't hyperbole. This was an emotion. This wasn't a feeling. Is that this is a scripture? Is that Paul was the hardest working apostle? Mm -hmm. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some innate quality that Paul had. It wasn't some incredible skill or talent that he was just an, an extraordinary, naturally hard worker. Mm -hmm. Is that it was his understanding of God's grace, yeah. 
God's grace had such a profound impact on Paul that it changed him. Mm. It, it motivated him to work hard. Mm. And this has been something that I've struggled with. I've struggled with it my entire life. I've struggled with it my entire discipleship. Mm. Is being a hard worker. Suffering. Persevering. In, enduring hardship. And... Thank you, my brother. And what this is... Again, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to deceive myself. According to the Bible, it's very clear. It's a lack of understanding God's grace in my life. The Bible's simple. It's easy to apply it to other people, but it's difficult to apply it to yourself. Yeah. And... Yeah, I just got to stand up here and just apologize to you guys. I'm the evangelist, I'm the leader, and I've not been a good example of someone who's been changed by God's grace. But what you see is that God, His, His grace, it is... God's a gracious God. God's a patient God. Mm -hmm. But God's grace is not unlimited. Mm -hmm. There comes to a point where God's grace runs out. Mm -hmm. And what you see with people in the Bible, this happened, there are many examples of this. They die. Mm -hmm. God kills them. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell me? Mm -hmm. I'm not dead. Mm -hmm. Amen, bro. <laughs> God hasn't, the grace hasn't run out. So. It's that I'm here. It's another day. God continues to show grace in my life. God continues to allow me to be here. God continues to, to allow me to have another chance. And I think what, what God he spoke to me very clearly last night is that I've got to be someone who understands God's grace. Mm -hmm. But most of all, I've got to be someone who's changed by God's grace. Mm -hmm. In the future, I look forward to having an example where it's obvious, like, wow, man, call me someone who, who really believes he's the least of the evangelists. He's the least of the disciples. Wow, call me someone who's really changed by God's grace. Mm -hmm. But... Right now I'm in it. Mm -hmm. And if you can relate to what I'm saying, let's be in it together. Mm -hmm. Let us allow ourselves to be changed by God's grace. Because all of us have received God's grace. Mm -hmm. All of us are still here. Is that God has chosen each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. What I love about Ephesians, we just go there, is it? Mm. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter, or Ephesians chapter 1, sorry. See, because grace is awesome. It's great that, that despite all of my sin before becoming a disciple, despite all of my sin as a disciple, I still get grace. But what's even more inspiring is that is God's plan for grace. In Ephesians 1, it says in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one who he loves in the way of redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined 
according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were at first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Not only do we get God's grace, but God had a plan to give us his grace before the creation of the world. And this is a mystery. It's like, man, I, didn't, I don't understand that. I can't think about it for too long. But, but understanding that God chose me, that it wasn't an accident, that the, the grace that, that I've received, it wasn't a, a, a casual throwaway thoughts. It wasn't a random happenstance coincidence. It was a plan. Because that's how much God loves me. That's how much God loves you. And when I see that, it inspires me. Yeah. When I see that, it gives me hope. Yeah. It gives me hope to change. Yeah. It gives me hope to be a better man. Yeah. Come on, Lord. It gives me hope to come to God to say that, hey, I, I need more grace. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to our final passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be strong in the grace? It means you understand grace. You have a, a strong understanding of grace. But not just a strong understanding, you have a strong conviction on grace. Why? And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Amen. What is this? This is world evangelism. Mm. You must be strong in the grace mm. so that you can teach other people about God's grace and so that they can teach other people about God's grace. Mm. This is what we got to do. This is, again, this is Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. Mm. Go and teach people about God's grace. We can't teach people about God's grace if we don't get God's grace. Right. Mm. Yeah, we can't give somebody something that we don't have. Yeah. We can't give somebody a conviction on God's grace if we don't have a conviction. Yeah. We can't allow other people to be changed by God's grace if we've not been changed by God's grace. Mm. So church, mm. this is what we've got to go back. We've got to go back to the, the fundamentals. Yeah. The most powerful, the most inspirational concept in all of Christianity, God's grace. Amen. For it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. Amen. It's time for us to go back to having faith in Jesus and in the grace that he provides. So that we can be strong in the grace. Amen. And then we can teach this to other people, to other people, to fulfill God's plan for world evangelism. Amen.